Well, I'm, I'm feeling 98% confident uh, as an architect. I'm, that's how I should be feeling. Um, I, th I think I'm feeling 50% confident, and I, I hope to be able to explain why in the course of this presentation. Um, two great presentations from Tim and David, leaving me thinking that what I would like to do in this is describe some of the opportunities that I see for bringing these tools into the day-to-day -day activities of planners and architects to help us speculate on what the future might look like. And architects and planners have, by their professional obligation, to speculate. It's our job. We have to be professionally creative. One of the big problems that Tim highlighted in his slides is that the product of planners and architects has often failed. We've, we haven't anticipated how people are going to use the cities that have been created uh, or the systems that are behind those physical places. And we've ended up with the kind of problems that were laid out, social problems, economic problems. How can we get better at forecasting? And I believe uh, that digital technology is our creative partner and will be if we learn how to harness the data. Uh, I thought David's point is exactly the right one. Otherwise, we're just going to make even bigger problems and even greater social and, and economic uh, challenges will follow. So I'd like to try and show how we can de-risk planning and design through using technology, a technology called space syntax, which I came across 25 odd years ago when I was becoming increasingly disillusioned that architecture had very little rigor to it and pretty much still doesn't in most of architecture. There's very little science used in the process of design. There's a lot of whim, a lot of emotion, a lot of subjectivity. And we frankly get away with this uh, in the absence of any greater capability, rigor, data, science. And I guess as a young budding architect, I just thought this was a, a falsehood I couldn't entertain. And I discovered Bill Hillier and Space Syntax at UCL offering a completely different view that I want to set out, one in which you can use science to be more creative and to de-risk the planning process. And my first point about connectivity which is at the heart of space syntax, is that this isn't a new concept. We've, we've had connectivity in the street grid of our city, cities for as long as we've had cities. Physical connectivity is in our DNA. I'll come back to this. And if we look at what Pompeii teaches us, is that those physical connections have great value. The simple long route through the heart of Pompeii is the main street which gathers all the movement, and so the traders put their shops there and make lots of money out of it and build themselves fabulously wealthy houses just off the high street. So where there's connectivity, there's trade. And if we get the physical design right, the economic benefits of connectivity are massive. We learned a long time ago that if you have connectivity, you need to be able to move across it, in other words, cross the road, and move along it. In other words, connect from one part of the street to the next. And in doing so, integrate infrastructure. Those big stepping stones permit a big curb, which means that when it rains, all the water can flush the streets, cleanse them, take the waste somewhere else. Integrated infrastructure is an aspect of connectivity that we've had for as long as we've had cities. Where we have great intensities of connectivity, the, the central nodal points of cities, we took the cars away and we pedestrianized them because there were so many people on foot that we wanted to maximize the opportunity for interaction between those people, social, economic, political. This is the forum at Pompeii. And we learned how to transition between one mode of transport and the other. We, we've had bollards for as long as we've had connections. Now, what the scientific impetus of space syntax did was to explain exactly what we mean by connectivity. This is what we do day in, day out. We make the invisible visible, if you like, because one of the truths of connectivity is you sometimes can't see it. You can't see space. So what we do with space syntax is to turn the public space of the city into a 
discrete set of line elements. In other words, objects that can be read by a computer program. And then we run algorithms through those networks and measure things like the hierarchy of connections in the grid. And we use color. We try to make it as visually accessible as possible so that it isn't just the scientists who can understand it. It's every stakeholder, whether they are the politician or the resident of the failed housing estate. The hot red lines are the most connected. They're the ones which physically have more connections to others. They're straighter, longer, you can see further down them. The less well-connected ones in the hierarchy, yellow, green, and then blue. Very simple, very straightforward. The mathematics is not complicated and it's entirely open, by the way. However, what we've discovered is that this pattern of connections has profound implications for the performance of urban places. The more connected the street, the more pedestrian movement we find on them. The more vehicle movement we find on the more connected streets. This simple method of analyzing the network of space in a city gives us a very robust, effective, simple and quick form of traffic modeling of different modes simultaneously. So if you like, it's a new form of urban traffic modeling. I say new, it's been around for over 30 years. However, it's only, I think, now reaching the point where it's becoming normal, accepted, part of the fabric. And it's very much our mission as a business to fully disseminate it into everyday architectural practice. As we saw in Pompeii, so we find in other cities that the majority of shops, this is central London, 80% of London shops, the red blobs in this image, locate on the 20% most accessible, most connected streets. Now this is not, it shouldn't be rocket science. We should know this stuff. However, what the 20th century did in urban planning was to unlearn all of these rules. We put shopping into precincts, we separated where people live from where they work, from where they take leisure, from where they shop, and we connected those precincts with highways, the inverse of this compact mixed-use form of planning. So one of the roles of space syntax is to tell the story, explain the common sense, so that once it's obvious, everybody can accept it and move on. The problem is we're up against paradigms, the way the transport modeler thinks, the way the town planner thinks. However, we keep pushing. We keep presenting the evidence, for example, crime, more burglary in the less well-connected places. Now, the people who take this really seriously are the police forces and security services and the residents who've had their windows put in or their doors put in and are having to suffer the insurance costs. And the other people who then take it seriously are the insurers so that they can set premiums more accurately than they currently are. And connectivity, as I say, was, was lost in the 20th century. This is the city of Albany in the US in the 1950s, not unlike Pompeii, a connected set of streets, more or less on a rectilinear grid, not perfectly, with some open spaces, parks, but mostly tight, compact grid blocks. Only a few le years later, all of that has been destroyed. This is the form of, a form of destruction through positive planning. Very strange form of, uh, of loss, but the walkable, cyclable, short drivable grid has been replaced by highways, the railway station has gone, and we are left with something very typical. I, I could go through city after city after city all over the world that did this and destroyed what we saw of the wealth of Pompeii, their own versions of it. And we can see this numerically. On the left is a less well-connected form of planning for the same site as on the right, which is a more connected form. The algorithm runs through the, the plan that the architect has come up with and measures the connectivity. And what we've done here is link it to a cash flow analysis of real estate value over the lifetime of the project. On this one development in the edge of the central London, there's half a billion US dollars of net present value difference between one architectural proposal and the next. This is the kind of value we're making or losing when we make otherwise subjective judgments about whether we like one master plan or the other. And of course that difference is the difference between a few bridges, 
half a billion US dollars of difference could be generated by constructing three or four bridges that might cost 50 million pounds. Now, then offset the cost against the value. Use these analytics to bring together, as we've heard from other presenters, different aspects of professions. Connectivity is hardwired into our DNA. That the cognition and wayfinding navigation scientists talk about place cells and grid cells. So I believe that what we see in cities is a natural product. The historic connected city is a natural product. It's not something that some Roman planner thought up. It came from inside us. That's why the grid is the most consistent form of urbanism worldwide. And as an architect, what I really liked about space syntax was that it was a tool I could design with. It was a friend who could tell me, is this the right layout of streets to place into the empty space as it was behind King's Cross? Will this grid of streets work? Will it be red or blue or green? If, if I want shops, will they have enough footfall? Well, in a few seconds, I can run a model that tells me, well, actually, no. Although this grid is connected within itself, it isn't sufficiently connected to the wider city that it isn't going to pull people through, whether they're walking or cycling or driving. And so go back to the drawing board, try something else, ask around the rooms, workshop it. Let me see your proposal. Let me see your proposal. Let's put each of them into a model and see whether we can find one that works. Well, this one works very well because we've taken the connections from the outside of the site and we've brought them into the middle of the site. We've integrated the local with the global, which is one of the key principles of urban planning. By all means, think lo local, but connect globally. And that's what gets you a Pompeii, it gets you a Paris, it gets you a Manhattan, it gets you a Sydney, it gets you every single city that was built on the face of the earth until about 1910 when we suddenly decided that we knew better than natural history, and we started to reinvent ourselves around landscape urbanism, garden cities, and then Corbusier came along. And at that point, we lost the plot for about a, you know, 100 years. So with these tools, we don't remove our innate or our professional responsibility to create. We still have to sit around the table with each other we still have to get the pens out. It's just we can get the pens out, and if you can see Fred on the right, has his phone in his hand, he's using mapping software, and there's another device on the table, bottom left. And this is how I see the future. We're using our traditional skills of drawing and the new technologies of analytics to help us along the way. So we start with a sketch, and we move on to a more rigorous analysis of land use. We run a predictive model, which is forecasting, in this case, the pedestrian movement flows coming from the proposals for the Haygate uh, estate in the Elephant and Castle. We're coloring them up to make them nice and easy for people to read. We have to take them to retail agents. They want things that are nice and easy to then try to sell space against. Do we have enough footfall? They might come back and say, well, no, I need another 500 people an hour if I really want to get that particular use in. Go back, well, how can I design that in? Is there a connection I haven't spotted yet? Can I link things together more effectively? Run models and test the impact of new schemes at every scale, whether it's a master plan of that scale or whether it's just a humble pedestrian crossing. We can always do better. We can remove subways, remove footways, remove the guard railing that we have a love affair with in the UK and replace crossings with something more dignified like this design for the elephant, accommodating cycling and walking and busing and driving and servicing all at the same grade, but in a form of landscape which allows you to sit in the middle of the junction if you can make out there's a few benches in there. Why not play a game of chess? If the emissions are right, why not sit among the hubbub? People have done it for millennia. We love being in the presence of other people. Let's think differently about the humble pedestrian crossing. Let's think differently about the city in its entirety. And we are using space syntax in cities like Jeddah in Saudi Arabia to create new plans like the one on the right, which connects more effectively, in this case, the hot red or the boulevards, which are going to create more street-based wealth 
for that city. We're encouraging people to walk in Jeddah, to take public transport, to challenge cultural presumptions that people are not going to do either of those things in that culture or that climate. It's simply not the case. People will walk and people will take leisure if they're given opportunities to. Similarly in China, rapid urbanization. Tim referred to the energy take or the implications of the food, the diet of the Chinese population has an energy take. Equally, the transport and the car ownership. We're working in cities like Changchun in China to grow the city in a way that stops it from sprawling and fragmenting and allows it to have a density that will allow public transport to work. And even beyond Changchun, going out hundreds of kilometers to the next city to make sure that the connectivity between allows large-scale public transport, train networks, to be most effective, to stop in places where there's enough density to drive them. I'm moving at a pace just to show you as many examples as I can in the time and few minutes I've got remaining. And we're doing this in workshops. Again, this isn't one of those, I worry when I see those control rooms full of screens as if you know, with one press of the button, I'm going to run the city. No, it's about people coming together. It's about us networking and using the analytics to inform the discussions and judgments that we make through face-to-face -face contact. It means getting the colored pencils out as well as the colored lines of models like this and bringing it back to the prosaic English landscape of a place like Didcot. What does it look like when you add 10,000 houses to the countryside of Didcot? And when the local population worries that it's going to swamp their beautiful historic village, quite reasonably so. Well, can you design a layout, as we've been working on here, to avoid pushing traffic through existing villages? And again, if there were longer to go through it, I'd be able to point out the village in the middle and how it's barely affected by the movement of the new development around it, because we've designed new streets, new linkages to take the pressure off the old. And then coming home, at least for this presentation, and zooming out, looking nationally at the United Kingdom's system of cities, running models now, which allow us to, within about an hour, model a new railway link and move cities around or grow cities or, sh or shrink cities. Look at the implications, look at scenarios and consider their implications. And this means combining road modeling, rail modeling, by connecting the stations to the road system around it and making scenarios to say what would happen if we had better rail connections in the north or better rail connections in the south. Let's speculate. And it allows us to look into the future, 25, 50 years, and then plan backwards and see what we need to do now to make any of this possible. How can cities move around in the hierarchy? How can we access new employment populations, new jobs, that weren't available to us before because we lived too distant from them? How can new rail connectivity help that? How can we integrate data? We've heard a lot about that already today. We've been doing this now for 25 years as a business. Computing's increasingly making it easier for us to, to do so, and we're enthusiastic about the processing power increases. Every day we grab them, linking carbon emissions, land value, crime, as you've already seen, but always at the base, the spatial layer, because it always comes down to the physical places where people are going to be. And this physical layer helps link those data together. Creating, disseminating, making open our methodologies. We firmly believe that this stuff should not be locked in the cabinet of our studio, but should be accessed by anyone who wants it. And allows us to take clients on journeys from uncertainty to decision making. That allows us to take the kind of actions that too often planning has been slow to take. To get us back, oh, this is, that, that would sound really corny if I said to get us back to a future, so I won't say that. <laughs> to take us to a future where we, the future might look more like Pompeii, where it's around streets and spaces. It's around places where people can connect. And of course, digital connectivity will be there, but it's the physical connectivity that I believe will make the big difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Hopefully you're challenged with all those thoughts and ideas. What's the one thing you want to share with everybody, Tim? Well, it's really that last thought, that the digital connectivity is, is so much about what we so often talk about, but it's using that digital to enable 
the basic physical that is about being human. Thank you.